Welcome to the Michelle Tafoya Podcast. Well, I, I like your hopefulness there. The canceling of the American mind is, is this your fourth or your fifth book? Depending on which, what do you call a book, this is my fourth. I wrote a very short book called Freedom from Speech, which I always wonder if it's short, long enough to even be considered a book, but I'm I proud of it. You should be, and I think we're going to call it a, a book. Um, the foreword in here by Jonathan Haidt is really revealing, and, and the names of the chapters are really revealing. What we know is that it, it, this is what I always come back to. To me, it started with coddling, and I know the, the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, a student gets sensitive and everyone goes and rushes to protect that student, provide yeah. him or her a safe space, uh, segregate libraries, whatever it is, so that people, you know, the, the book White Fragility comes out and that word fragility just gives me the, the heebie-jeebies. It, it likens me to, it, for me, I, I think of this. I have two children. Uh, I raised I raised them to be tough to, you know, oh, you got sick. That's okay. All right, fine. We're, you know, maybe antibiotics, maybe not, but I'm not going to, you know, stop you from going to, to a daycare because viruses run around daycares. Yeah. You're going to run into these. And the only way to get some, you know, thick skin is to run into these and get right. through them. Same with, uh, you got to fight with your friends, go figure it out. I'm not here to protect you. I'm going to try to tell you what I think and what your stance should be, but, or could be, but let's yeah. go figure it out. You, you got it. You you don't go through the world unscathed. And if you do, it's pretty uninteresting. And by the way, the scar tissue is really, really helpful all through your life. Yeah. So, but we're not as a society and particularly in these higher institutions of learning, it doesn't seem like we want to allow kids to go through that. We're so protective and that makes for weak, unchallenged, really uninteresting people. It also makes for anxious and depressed people. I mean, that that was the, um, uh, the the revelation that led to coddling the American mind. And ultimately, it came from me getting, to be frank, suicidally depressed back in 2007, partially because by being in the culture war all the time, I just got mentally exhausted. Because if you're consistent in your values um, on freedom of speech, all but a, a relatively a relative handful of deeply principled people um, will hate you when you defend someone on their side and love you when you defend someone, um, uh, you know, that they like, and this can be just exhausting. And while I was recovering from that, I studied cognitive behavioral therapy. And what you learn from CBT is when your brain gives you those exaggerated, like a date goes wrong and you're like, my life is a failure. You yeah. know, um, I'll, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die alone. Like all of these kind of exaggerated things. It doesn't, preach the power of positive thinking, it preaches just simply rationally interrogate that. Actually ask yourself, is this, am I catastrophizing here? <laughs> am I mind reading? Am I claiming to know the future? And if you get used to it, um, and it's been a revelation for me, like my, my, my depressive episodes and anxiety um, have improved wildly um, since, um, uh, since studying it. But on campus, I'm like, wait a second. On campus, you seem to be telling people do catastrophize, do engage in emotional reasoning, yeah. do do negative filtering. And I'm like, not only is this going to be a disaster for academic freedom and free speech, which it has been, it's going to be a disaster for mental health, which was our theory going into the original article, which we uh, started writing in 2014, wrote in 2015, and our book, Coddling the American Mind. Um, and man, the, the, the mental health part of it, we thought we'd see like a little scholarly dip in young people's mental health. And it's been an absolute disaster. It's yeah. been so much worse than even John and I thought. Uh, it's, it's really sad. And what makes it all the more sad and frustrating is it, it doesn't have to happen. No, it's, not, it's really not that hard to prevent this. Honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the moment it can be a challenge, but are we that lazy that we don't want to stress ourselves to go through these things with our kids, with our students, with our friends and help to make them stronger. That's how did we get that week? That's what I wonder. Yeah, no, no. And, and, it, and this leads me to point out one of the differences between cod <coughs> coddling of the American mind and canceling of the American mind. My, my follow-up um, with the great 23 year old Ricky Schlott, who's just absolute genius and height does the foreword for, for our new book um, is that, Cancel culture, I really, not sorry, <clears throat> coddling, um, I really do uh, attribute largely to um, good intentions and bad ideas. Yeah. Whereas cancel culture <clears throat> is 
people feeling they're justified in being cruel and just loving the opportunity to be really, really cruel to individual yeah. people. So it's yeah. a, that I don't think is good intentions. I think that's actually harnessing some of the worst of human nature. And, and people always feel better about being nasty if they think they're doing it for a good cause. Sure. Um, but when it comes to uh, coddling, I think one of the things that's happened is we all like, um, and the social science is very clear on this. We increasingly live more isolated from people we politically disagree with, um, like in physical space. And then, of course, on social media, you can completely wall yourself off from people you disagree with. And I think the left and the right kind of needed each other because, yeah, you know, like if, if you're looking for things to change and you're on the left and you, and you want, you know, progress, um, that's healthy. But it helps to be balanced out by someone who's reminding you of ancient wisdom, of conservative, uh, you know, philosophy, because they balance each out, uh, they're out pretty well. But when they're completely not talking to each other, you end up in a situation where just the any of the ancient wisdom, any of the old ideas about how to raise kids, about why it's actually not doing them a favor to not have them be somewhat tough uh, to to be able to handle stress and anxiety. Um, Nobody's saying that to them anymore. So parents, you know, who grow up, uh, who raise their kids in this way are only hearing, you've got to protect them, you got to protect them, you got to protect them. Oh, you don't want them to be traumatized by getting a B. You know, you don't want them to be traumatized by losing a sports match, you know, and, and, and it's just like, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I remember actually reading a book called "The Myth of the Spoiled Child," like the uh, uh, an embarrassing book. No, no, no. I mean, I was about to say no offense to the author. Nah, I guess I, I guess <laughs> I, I, I was sort of offending the author, but it, it talked about the horror of and the pain you'd be causing a student if they, um, you know, lost a game. And I'm like, I was a football player. Guess what happens when you lose games? You get used to it, and you're kind of like, oh, okay. And it actually made the wins all that much sweeter and all that much, all that much better. So we've lost all this ancient wisdom about how to raise kids to get them ready, you know, to, to, to prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. And now we're seeing it actually almost this term's overused, but weaponized that essentially kind of like the fragility of, of children that we've created artificially because they're not naturally fragile creatures. Right. They're actually naturally quite strong. Yeah. And now we're turning that into, oh, but you can't say that because now our, our students will definitely be hurt by hearing a non-conforming, usually conservative opinion. And so that's where this cancellation stuff comes in as well. It's it's and it is mean and it is th th there are bad intentions behind canceling someone. You so can't handle what they've said that you think rather than just saying, OK, I'm going to turn the page or I'm going to not follow them on social media or I'm going to change the channel. You're saying they should be punished. Yeah. And it's crazy to me because I am like you. Free speech is absolutely essential if we're going to stay who we are and, and stay true to our values as civilized people. So, you know, I, I had someone say to me, well, what if 95% of the campus doesn't want this person to speak and only 5% of them do? I mean, they're, they shouldn't be allowed to speak because so many people don't want them to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, it doesn't work that way. We got to defend even the people whose thoughts we can't stand. Yeah. We don't have to go attend it. Don't go. Yeah. You don't go. I, I, it seems simple to me. And I'm wondering what it's going to take to, f to have this reemergence, if you will, of this toughness, of this ability to see yourself as resilient and to see yourself as someone who can handle the violence of a word. Yeah. Well, I mean, we spent about a third of the book talking about potential solutions. And Ricky and I are both under no illusion that, um, that th those are even enough. Um, we have to think about how we teach K through 12. We have to think about how we do higher education. We have to think about how we parent our own children. I mean, I learned so much about parenting my, 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 uh, my kids. Um, this is a nice one. Oh, um, <laughs> of, uh, they're now five and seven. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot from, uh, writing, uh, and, and working on the, the coddling of the American mind. And I, want to be really clear. I'm an anxious parent. Absolutely. 100%. Um, but you have to overcome that if yeah. you want to have kids who can lead, lead a, like a fully self-actualized life. Uh, kids who have self-efficacy. The idea, you know, sometimes things like I had superpowers 
when I got to higher education compared to a lot of my classmates because I'd had a job since I was 11 and right. my mom worked. Right. Nights, you know, like so. And it, and it was really funny to see people who couldn't like the the novelty of personal freedom, just watching them kind of like spiral downward and being kind of like, OK, that, that's not a big deal, man. And that's the thing that people don't get. And I say this to my kids and this is where I sound incredibly old fashioned, but um, but I believe it. Boys, if you can learn to enjoy study and work, your life is going to feel easy. Yeah. And I say that as someone who, you know, um, with the exception of the stress of the culture war, which does still exhaust me, mm. getting to be a First Amendment attorney, I mean, it's one of the great joys of my life. It, I can see that. I mean, I can see it in the way you comport yourself, but I could also see why that is. Because it is so, to me, it's so undeniably right. I can't think of anything more right. I don't know if righteous is the word, but more more correct on every level than someone's ability to speak for him or herself. Now we have now. I, tell me, because yep. we're in a moment right now as yeah. we record this in o late October, heading toward November of 2023, where we do have on campus. Uh, a Cornell professor saying he was exhilarated yeah. by the terrorist attacks by Hamas. We have all of these protests. Yeah. And and now we've got people who are essentially saying all that torture, rape, murder, awfulness that we saw, we support it. Yeah. So this is this is where it gets a little dicey. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. No, it's interesting because definitely on the left, there's a perception right now that there's this massive backlash against even kind of horrifying, like pro Hamas, Palestine, uh, pro Palestinian speech. And I'm, I'm so far, I'm not. We are investigating some cases, uh, but I'm not really seeing that. And that's partially because pro-Palestinian point of view is incredibly popular, particularly on elite campuses. The polling is actually kind of troubling, the extent to which kids under 25 are very much reflexively pro-Palestinian uh, pro and, and default-wise pro-Hamas, like um, the, in, in the current fight, as if Hamas really speaks for the Palestinian people, um, as opposed to being you know a real problem for it. Right. Uh, so we're not seeing the kind of clampdown um, that we've seen in the past. And Overall, we're a free speech organization, so we think that's a good thing. There have been people who have definitely crossed the line and who are engaging in threats, actual discriminatory harassment. Um, there was a case actually at Stanford where a professor um, had his Jewish students raise their hands, the first asking them if they're Jewish, then have them go take their stuff, go to the corner, and now I'm going to lecture you on apparently the allegation that, oh, you're colonizers, was what, what, what he called them, and that colonizers are responsible. Like, they asked him, how many people died in the Holocaust? And they said, six million. And it's like, well, colonizers have killed more, more than that. It's like, you, you think that, that Israel has killed more than six million Palestinians? Like, the, I, give me a sight on that guy. So that's a case where... That's something you can absolutely punish a professor for. That is out and out discrimination. And if this had been someone doing this to black students, they would have immediately understood that this is completely inappropriate. We've also been seeing situations where it's like, you know, that's a threat. No, that's actual intimidation. No, that's actually when it comes to the professor saying that he was exhilarated. Yeah. You can't have a rule that um, that professors you know need to be fired because they're even being highly offensive. Right um, now. If you look into the professor, it turns out he's, he can't treat his Jewish students well. That's a completely different case. Right. Um, and, and we definitely, you know, have seen ones where you kind of wonder, you know. But uh, so, you know, we're genuinely nonpartisan. What I would hope is that the current moment on campus would be a moment for uh, pro-Palestinian students to suddenly start getting freedom of speech and start getting that consequence culture was always like a flippant, stupid thing to say, <laughs> sorry, um, and, and start to get maybe cancel culture looking in the recent disastrous past of cancel culture and say to themselves, wow, that we were probably wrong on that. But unfortunately, I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of people on the left actually saying um, their primary concern is like, oh, the, the right's hypocrites because the, they're fine with canceling someone who's pro Hamas. Um, but not someone who's like pro-Trump. And it's like, okay, first of all, like it's messed up to sort of like equate, uh, those the, yeah. equate these two things. But you've never taken this issue seriously in the past. And if they're calling you out for being hypocrites on, uh, on just selectively noticing it now, they have a point. Yeah, yeah. A point that I don't think they necessarily want to realize. Final question for you on, on this is, 
So you heard about students signing on to these declarations that were mm-hmm. really awful. Uh, and these are law students primarily. Yeah. And now you've got these big time law firms saying, you know, we had we had put out an offer to you for when you graduated to come work for us. We're rescinding that offer. Yeah, uh, it's a private company. As far as I know, yeah. they have the right to do that. Yeah. That they 100% have the right to do that. And I, and all I try to do is get people think about a situation in which, because this is what it started to look like in 2020 and 2021, that essentially every company was a private company, but also had a political point of view. So if you you know were critical of BLM, for example, you yeah. could be risking risking your career. Yeah. And I don't think that's a super healthy environment, you know, for democracy, for a democratic republic. Um, if you can technically have your First Amendment rights, but you can't hold down a job. Now, that's all I've been saying on this. And people are interpreting this as saying, you're saying that that companies need to hire people with repugnant points of view. And I'm like, I'm absolutely not saying that. I'm saying that I would like I would be happy if there was just a thumb on the scale for everyone's entitled to their opinion. But is that going to be enough to to make someone who, for example, works with Israeli companies or actually has a lot of you know Jewish employees to want to hire someone who seems to think that, you know, the, 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 the rapists and murderers were right. No, it probably won't be enough to overcome it. But I do hope that that in the future case where a, a lot of these other situations where someone like retweets a joke you know, from a favorite comedian and ends up getting suspended, yeah. you know, you, you know, for months, I think that might be enough to help us be a little bit to have more b- both free speech culture and, 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 uh, and First Amendment law at the same time. I lied. One last thing, this <laughs> uprising of this support of not necessarily Palestine, but it, it, the support of Hamas. I mean, it's undeniable, yeah. right? It's undeniable yeah. that to be, and again, keep going back to that professor at Cornell who said, yeah. who said he was exhilarated. But I mean, when you saw what has happened, you continue to hear yeah. what has happened to innocent civilians. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and they say, oh, this is the resistance. This yeah. is, this is, we've been oppressed for so long. This, it just seems like sane minds understand that no, that's not what this is. Yeah. And yet, do you see more people supporting the terrorists than you expected? I I do, um, and and I say that as someone who is familiar with a lot of the data about student attitudes about um, you know political issues, and it's definitely worse than I saw. My big fear now that there's been kind of a donor revolt about this is that some of the donors seem to be saying, okay, president, I know you, President Blah of some Ivy League school, I know you support Israel and I know you despise Hamas and you're too cowardly to say this because you're afraid that you will be canceled by your faculty and your administrators and your students um, who are vocally pro-Hamas because those people are, you know, they will hound you to, to, to you're done. And so cancel culture actually produced the situation to a degree. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate the donors are, are, are taking us a, a, a step up, but I don't want them to waste that just on saying, and you have to, com- um, uh, uh, to condemn Hamas. It's like, no, you should be thinking much bigger than that. The reforms that we need in higher education are much more dramatic. We need people to learn about, because I, I also think that these people who just kind of think that my pro Hamas point of view is something that a lot of people would agree with, that that's cancel culture too, because basically like, because the, the, the radical pro Palestinian voices have been so loud and you know scary to a lot of people, they haven't actually had a lot of disagreements because they're afraid they'll get canceled if they actually disagree. So I definitely think this is an opportunity for big reform. I wrote something in National Review. I'm going to be writing something on my sub stack, the eternally radical idea going more in depth. But I think that we, I, I think the best thing that could happen is if we created more alternative um, institutions to elite higher ed, because yes. I don't, I sometimes wonder if it actually can be saved at all. I, I wonder that too. I honestly do. It is like a, a massive question hanging over us. And either way, we got here over a number of years. This, yeah. this, this isn't just like, bam, it just happened. This is a frog that was boiling in the water from the yes. very beginning when he didn't know it. And now he's on the brink of death. So we've got to steer this ship and it may take just as long. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Michelle Tafoya podcast. James Lindsay. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may have not. We're going to introduce you. He's got a book called The Marxification of Education. By the way, you can follow him at Conceptual, ja- uh, Conceptual James, pro-America, anti-communist, based AF. 
And uh, you're at newdiscourses.com, which is a tremendous website if people haven't been there. So thank you for joining us. I know you've been at a couple of conferences. What is it people are asking you about these days based on the fact that you wrote the Marxification of Education? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I used to get asked a lot what's going on. And now I feel like uh, people are kind of getting a sense of what's going on, whether this is a I, I think that they have the sense that something's badly wrong in America and, and across the West. But some of them are, are much more dialed in and realize that what we're dealing with is a cultural revolution, kind of like what happened in China in the in the 60s. What can people direct their kids toward, you know, whether they're in high school or, or heading off to college? What kind of resources are there, James? Because I, I think I think people really are yearning for that. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the kid. Uh, I have, if I'll shill my own book, I have a book uh, a lot of people read called Cynical Theories from a couple of years ago that was adapted to a younger uh, a younger audience or a younger reader level audience called, and the book is called Social Injustice. For an adult, a smart adult, it's a five hour read for, you know, a smart high school kid. It's probably like a six or seven hour read. Yeah. It's not heavy on the academic mm -hmm. citations, but it breaks down in a very kind of soft way. The Cynical Theories was written from a center left perspective on purpose. The book Social Injustice retains that. So that's one resource that I've produced for, well, I've kind of helped produce. I didn't do the remix for younger audiences, but that I've helped produce for um, that age group. But I encourage them to read, uh, for example, there's a new book called Mao's America by Shi Van Fleet. It's very accessible. She wants young people to read it. It's yeah. brilliant. It explains that this is a cultural revolution like she lived through in China. I encourage people to read that. A lot of kids have read the kind of horrible books documenting what happened under the Nazis. Well, there's a very clear book that I don't think is hard. It's just long called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert Lifton. It was written in the 1960s documenting the horrors under Mao's China and the parallels to diversity, equity, inclusion and all of the kind of things that they're experiencing in their lives are pretty undeniable. If you go into it with that lens affixed, you can see very quickly the parallels, cancel culture looks like struggle sessions and so on and so forth. And it's really kind of an eye opener to understand what communism looks like when it's put into practice. And so I recommend those kind of books to really smart young people. There's another book by a woman. These are all kind of academic for like younger kids, but <clears throat> there's a book called uh, The Weaponization of Loneliness by Stella Morabito, a former CIA analyst. And it explains how tyrannical movements in general or totalitarian movements create and weaponize a feeling of loneliness, which I think a lot of our young people are experiencing. And it'd be very helpful for them to see you're being made to feel lonely by being forced to lie about what you believe so that you don't feel like you've connected to anybody else. And again, this has parallels, whether it's under Oliver Cromwell's Puritans, whether it's under the French Jacobins, whether it's under the Bolsheviks in Russia, under Mao Zedong in China, you see these exact same parallels. So I encourage all of that. I also encourage them to get involved uh, with, if they don't wanna get involved in the organization or Turning Point USA, start looking at their, their materials at least. Turning Point USA puts a lot of effort into producing education materials for that age group. Um, and I'm encouraging people right now as broadly as possible to start making more and more material for that age category. Yeah, I, it's so important. And Prager, you is the same. We had G Van Fleet on this show and I found her so compelling. And, you know, she's got a, a significant Twitter following. And I, and I just, I, it's, it is amazing to me how if people can't see it, I don't know how they can't. Because to me, it's very, very clear. What's interesting is I, I always think, to, when did the seeds really get planted here in America? Because there are a lot of conflicting opinions about that. Some people think as early <laughs> as the 1920s, those seeds began being planted. Um, and, and I just, uh, the other part I can't, get my head around, and this is maybe where my naivete or my Pollyanna outlook gets in my way, but I don't understand why someone would want to take the freest country on earth and change it. It's, it's, it's got to be outside forces, but some people inside are allowing this to happen. To what end? What do they think is better than what we have? Well, <clears throat> what they think is better is the overcoming of all oppression that they can imagine. In other words, as Stella Morbido explains in her book, uh, Weaponization of Loneliness, 
what 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 you're dealing with is people who are actually pathological. They're involved in narcissistic self-worship on a very profound level. So rather than deal with the challenges of life as they come and as they are, they want to rearrange the challenges of life to suit them and their personalities because they're the most important thing in the universe, hence the self-worship. I just watched a video of a young woke woman getting arrested for drunk driving, driving the wrong way in traffic. It went on Twitter kind of viral this morning. And she's saying she's arguing with the cop, you know, that she has all of these excuses. She's non-binary. She's indigenous. You know, she has PTSD and anxiety and she's afraid of cops and she's blah, blah, blah. She's afraid of white people. And for all these reasons where she shouldn't be arrested. And it's just this desire to rearrange reality around your own whims. I think that that's why people want to transform it. As for the seeds, there were seeds. I don't know. I mean, we're in it. We're going to go deep into stupid metaphors here, but maybe <laughs> it was more that in the 20s, they tilled the soil and tried to plant some seeds that didn't really take. Okay. There was a lot of infiltration of the communism in, into the United States from starting in 1919 is when the CPUSA started in the U.S. And um, we know that there was a lot of communist infiltration because of the work of people like Senator Joseph McCarthy, who was rooting it out in the 1950s. I think he did a lot of damage to the movement at the time, but it was embedded in things like Hollywood and media and uh, <clears throat> increasingly in education. But the real seeds that we're dealing with today, the seeds of woke, were actually planted unambiguously in the 1960s. And it doesn't matter how you want to cut it, whether it's in education, whether it's in, in you know, infiltrating the, what they call the long march through the institutions, which got its name in 1966 from a radical named Rudy Deutschke, which was implemented by radicals after Herbert Marcuse called for it in his 72 book, Counter-Revolution Revolt. It's very clear that this generation in the 1960s were all inspired by Mao and the successes Mao was having in his revolution in China. Uh, Paulo Freire, who designed the education system that we now implement across the West in order to do brainwashing, attributed his methodology to Mao. Herbert Marcuse derived his, his basic formulas, uh, whether it's identity politics, whether it's the criticism and, and, and uh, problematization of all things, whether it's uh, the repressive and liberating tolerance dichotomy that he laid out in 1965, he, were, he attributed all of this to the success of the revolution, these tools in the revolution in China. The saying in the 60s, the chant was Mao Mark, uh, Marx Mao Marcuse. So these three Marxists, Marx himself, and then, but Mao Zedong is right there in the middle being facilitated into the West through uh, Marcuse. Turns out all of intersectionality, really, we could, if we wanted to lay the blame on a single person, Marcuse's student, Angela Davis, who's very famous to this day, kind of brought a lot of those ideas that were extremely Maoist into the forefront of identity politics into what was called the black feminist movement at the time. Intersectionality falls out of the black feminist movement. It reproduces Mao's identity politics that he used to control China and take over China with the good categories and the bad categories in an overwhelming um What's the right word? I want to say pressure pump uh, to drive people from the unacceptable, deplorable identities into the acceptable revolutionary identities. We see this with, you know, certain identities, white, straight, male, et cetera, are, are tied to all kinds of evil. But you can, you know, exonerate yourself by becoming a revolutionary queer identity, which nobody can question because it's completely subjective. And you see this powerful uh, incentive structure to join the revolution that's particularly effective on young people that's being flooded into the schools through the education method produced by another Maoist thinker. And so what we, where this, the seeds of what we're dealing with now really came from are the 1960s, which went heavily into education at all levels in the 1970s, and finally kind of were able to get the plane off the ground, I think in the 1990s is when, is when that really, uh, got successful for them. So, I mean, there's a very clear and straightforward academic and intellectual lineage that was informing the activism uh, earlier attempts from the 1920s, notwithstanding. Right. So if they want to emulate what <clears throat> Mao did, I mean, the, the repercussions <laughs> were that people were dying all over the place. So, yeah, maybe a hundred million. I, yeah. I, I don't, how does that get ignored in this effort or, or is it? 
Well, the usual thinking is that Mao had it mostly right, but missed some of the important details that therefore led to the deaths of 100 million or more people. Oops. But they definitely do support Mao. And I have the firsthand experience with this. I was recently, a few months ago, asked to speak at Northwestern University, which is an elite college. And it was heavily protested. The student government paid for people to protest against my speaking. The college Republicans and... Uh, if I'm in YAF chapters there at the college had me come. And so I spoke at Northwestern and they let all the people in that wanted to hear. And then they opened the doors to the protesters to fill the rest of the seats and kind of standing room in the back. And so, I don't know, 60 to 80 of the protesters wearing their masks and everything else came in and heckled and jeered and carried on. But the specifics of my talk that I gave were designed, was designed to explain intersectionality. And I wanted to explain that it is, American Maoism. It's just the derivative of Mao. So I talked a lot about Mao, kind of a history lesson of Mao. This should be a very non-controversial talk, but these exactly. they yelled and jeered and carried on. But when I, when I said that Mao was doing things like rounding up landlords and rounding up bad elements, and as they were called, and, and counter-revolutionaries and right-wingers, the woke kids in the room cheered. They clapped, they cheered, they hooped, they hollered. Um, there's even a young Chinese girl in the room whose family had been murdered in, in large proportion by Mao, who was aghast to find out this is how her, her, her fellow uh, schoolmates think. But they were excited about the fact that, that what they're participating in is Maoism. So I reminded them at the end to great jeering and making, making fun of me while I spoke that uh, what happened with the Red Guard, which is what they effectively are, in the West today, is that once Mao consolidated his power again in 1967 at the end of the year, by early 1968, he put out a declaration that the Red Guard had become too radical and too left and too dangerous, and he sent the People's Liberation Army after them, rounded them up, sent them to the countryside to die, or killed them in the street if they refused to go. Now, this turned out not to be a big problem because most of them were so brainwashed at that point that they would willingly get into the, the trains to the countryside or the trucks to the countryside saying that work in the field, work as a peasant would make their brains even more red. And they were enthusiastic to basically go die in primitive conditions, which is what most of them did. Um, and I, I told them that this is their future, that they are the red guard or the rainbow guard, as it were, or the green guard, depending on if it's LGBT or whether it's uh, the environmentalist yes. sustainability stuff that they're hooked into. And they laughed. And I said, I don't care if you want to laugh. I'm right. And you need to hear it. This is your yeah. future. If you yeah. win, you lose. Um, I'm trying to get them to understand that the implementation of diversity, equity, and inclusion is in fact the installation of a, of a softer form of what Mao installed in his prisons in order to affect thought reform. Uh, that is what the goal is. Equity is the goal of DEI. Equity's definition is an administered economy in which shares are adjusted so citizens are made equal. So it's socialism. Diversity and inclusion are the two excuses for bringing in interrogators. That's diversity. People who count as diverse. I just read this in an American Medical Association document last night. Um, people who are considered diverse are people who understand what it means properly to occupy a position of an underrepresented or marginalized group. In other words, they have a critical consciousness. So they're political officers. And then inclusion is that anything that insults or offends those highly motivated to be insulted and offended people yeah. needs to be excluded in order to create a condition of inclusion. This merely reproduces Mao's uh, formula that he used to consolidate power in the 1940s and then to transform China through the 1950s and 60s, which is what he called unity criticism unity. Uh, and he says that you, you start with a desire for unity, then you criticize those elements that are making it impossible to form a, a proper unity so that you can have a new unity on a new basis. The wording for that today is a little bit different, but the theme is the same. We just want to create a campus or an institution or a workplace. We just want to create a place where everybody feels like they belong. But we've got many problematic elements like racism and transphobia that are preventing us from feeling everybody feeling like they belong. And if we get together on this, then we can have a new unity on a new basis that's called a sustainable and inclusive future. And it's very clearly just a reproduction of the same thing. So if you read that book I mentioned, which is uh, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert J. Lifton, it becomes extremely clear that the DEI apparatus and workplaces and schools and universities, the entire kind of political officer structure and what it does in practice is that it creates the conditions of Mao's brainwashing prisons. 
but you're not in prison in the in the classical sense. You're just chained to your job. You're chained to the desire to get your degree. So you're actually voluntarily, in some kind of twisted sense, signing up for your own brainwashing so that you can earn a living, so that you can get a diploma. Right. And but but the program's the same. And this is this is what they've been installing with very uh, flowery and and language filled with bromides and all of this. Oh, it sounds so nice and good. We just yeah. want a belonging place where everybody feels included. Yeah. But for a communist, what it boils down to is communism is not included until it's the only thing there. And so you have to just continue to get rid of non-communist elements and include more communist elements. And that's the entire logic of inclusion. Uh, I could talk to you for hours. I, I really hope people will read The Marxification of Education and every other book you listed, folks. You heard them. So just rewind, listen again, write down the titles, write down the authors, read this stuff. Uh, it, 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 and just listen. This is it's it's striking uh, that. But I, I, I am buoyed by your hope and your optimism that that this massive ship is starting to turn around and I'm going to play as much a role as I can and I encourage everyone else to to join in that effort in any small way that they can. James Lindsay, you can find him at Conceptual James on Twitter. James Lindsay woke set a stone. I just love it. new resources. or excuse me, newdiscourses.com. My eyes are hurting me. Newdiscourses.com. You got to check it out. It's fantastic. I'm so grateful you spent some time with us today. I hope we can do it again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. He is James Lindsay. I'm Michelle Tafoya. As always, be brave, have some courage, and do good. Not in the virtue signaling department, but just a little bit of good here and there to counteract the evil. And we'll see you next time. 